Hi, everyone. I am Stephanie Way. I am one of the co-founders of Sportsbox, um, and I'm joined by some of my teammates. Of course, we have Dr. Phil Cheatham, who will be speaking shortly, and we have uh, Paul Park, our Director of Operations, and I think I saw Andy Heidorn, who does partnerships. Um, he's in there. And of course, Chris Mason, our guest, our special guest for the night. Uh, but without further ado, let me first hand things over to Phil. All Get right. Started. Thanks, Stephanie. Let me go ahead and uh, share the screen. Give me just a second. All right, now I just need to start the presentation. There you go, is that uh, visible to everybody at the moment? Yes. Thank you. All right, let's get going. All right, my part of the presentation then is about our newest tracker, lead wrist angle. And there's a lot of things we can see with this new tracker. So one of the first things I want to talk about, though, is, well, a lot of people would say, hey, I can already measure the wrist angle if I've got a 2D video. I just draw a line down the arm and a line down the shaft on the video. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work because the uh, it's an incorrect measurement, especially if the club is laid off. What you need to do whenever you're measuring an angle is you need to be looking directly onto that, uh, basically perpendicular to the two lines. I like to think of it as if you put place a piece of cardboard or a paper over the forearm and over the shaft, and then that's where you put your protractor and measure the angle. So that would follow the motion of the arm and the shaft and always give you a correct 3D motion or 3D angle. So you can see in this one, it looks like about hmm, 45 degrees, but the true angle when you rotate and look at it perpendicular is 90 degrees. So that being said, fortunately for us, we measure in 3D. So we can uh, give you the correct angle throughout the entire swing. So let's look at some stats and let, let's look at a definition of the lead wrist angle. On the right-hand side, we have the definition. It's simply, as I said, the angle between the lead forearm and the shaft. And as I said, again, I can't stress it more, is that it's measured in 3D from a perpendicular viewpoint. Wrist set would be when the angle is very small and that's near the top of the uh, backswing and it would be a lower value. When the wrist is released, that's towards the bottom of the swing and that's a higher value, more towards 180. It's more like 150, 100, 160 when you're at impact and it's measured in degrees. So here on the left, we have some, uh, can you see my, my cursor? I'm not sure, let me grab one the laser pointer. Okay, that's better. So on the left here, you can see a, short, a small table with men and women. These are tall pros, uh, 94 in the database for men, and unfortunately only 24. We're building that up, getting more women uh, in our database. And so you have three positions here at the top of backswing, watch the wrist angle, at, re at the release point, and at arm 30 degrees. I guess I have to explain that one a little bit. That's the, where the arm is about 30 degrees to the vertical down around the impact point. Uh, we use that because we found that to be the most sensitive to giving you an idea of whether there's an early release or whether that angle is, is larger than it should be. And so let's quickly just look at these um, numbers and, and we can talk about tracker truth. Uh, we call a tracker basically a kinematic parameter that's measured throughout the entire swing. So a wrist angle measured through the, the entire swing is a kin kinematic parameter because kinetics is the measurement of, sorry, kinematics is the measurement of motion. However, these at individual points in the swing, we call these indicators. So these indicators give us information that we need about uh, the performance, like key performance indicators, basically, you can think of them that way. So at the top, we find the men are 89 degrees, and the women are about 85 degrees, not much difference there. And then at the release point, um, and the release point varies depending on your skill level, 
we find that both the men and the women are almost, well, they are identical according to these stats. They're both at about 83 degrees. Now at arm um, 30 degrees, which is about this picture down here, we find the men are at 102 degrees and the women are at 109 degrees. So they're a little bit more released. They've got a little bit larger angle than the men do. And that turns out to be actually statistically significantly different. Whether that's a technique issue or a strength issue, that's debatable. But we have looked at the profiles of both men and women, and you'll see profiles in just a second. Uh, the men and the women have extremely similar wrist angle profiles. So it seems to be more like a, a strength issue. Um, I have a whole presentation on that. We'll talk about that um, another time. Okay, so what are these profiles that I'm talking about? Well, if you graph the wrist angle, and we will be having graphs in the system, but for the time being, we do it for our testing so that we can uh, check the accuracy of each of the curves. Um, but I'll show you a few curves here just to give you an idea of what the different types of profiles are. We have four main, or at least I've classified it into four main release characteristics or profiles. The first one is early release, or you can call it casting if you like. And that, what this graph shows you is that the angle gets down to a minimum around about um, top of backswing. This green line here is top of backswing. So this blue area is the downswing. And so as you progress from left to right, we're, we're going into the downswing and this dark black line is impact. So you see that the angle here swoops up very rapidly to its maximum value. So let's say it goes from about that 90 degree point that I was talking about all the way to about 150 degrees up here. The difference is in um, recreational golfers and novice golfers, you see the angle open immediately. They don't maintain a wrist step in the downswing. And this would be classified as early release or casting. The next one that we have, we call it a fixed angle release. And this is typical of some tour pros. What we see now at the top of backswing, the wrist reaches its minimum value and then maintains that value uh, early in the downswing and release, releases rapidly here at the green line later in the downswing. So that's called fixed and, and that has benefits. Um, and I'll explain the benefits of all of these methods in just, just a minute. Um, the downswing loading, that's where the angle of the wrist decreases at the top of backswing. And so the angle is getting smaller and smaller. And I'll show you a, a demonstration of that. Uh, on Sportbox uh, in the next slide or two. And then kind of a variation, which is really a combination of fixed uh, wrist set angle and downswing loading is what I call the late downswing loading. So in this case, at top of backswing, it has uh, a small value that is maintained until just before release. And then it rapidly decreases and then increases. So it's like just before the release, the wrist is down cocked or, or down sweet, downloaded, if you like. Um, yeah, so that's it. The, the advantages and disadvantages, the disadvantages of the early release is that throwing the club out early um, causes your rotational moment of inertia, which is your resistance to turning, to increase rapidly. So that makes it very, very hard to generate any speed. Um, so that's the disadvantage or one of the disadvantages of uh, casting or early release. It also doesn't allow for transfer of momentum from the arm to the club uh, in the manner that the other methods do. And it does not take advantage of what we call the stretch shorten cycle of muscle. In other words, the properties of muscle, they like to be stretched um, rapidly before releasing, and that way they can generate more power. So I, I've got a couple of slides on that coming up in, in just a second. All right, so here is an example um, of casting. If I can click the right buttons to make it go. Here we go. I want you to, I'll play it through a couple of times, and there's two things you need to watch. So you can watch one when it plays through once, and the other when it plays through again. 
one of the things is to watch this angle immediately start to increase as the backswing, uh, as the downswing occurs. The other one is to watch the wrist angle on the avatar, the angle between that forearm there and the shaft itself. And you'll see that opening very rapidly. And so by the time the arm is at about 30 degrees, the club, the angle between the shaft and the club is huge. And so that uh, all the transfer of momentum and all of the, the large moment of inertia, that's all hindered um, generating any speed. So you can see right at the bottom there, we're about 147. So let's move on and have a look at uh, a torque row now um, with a downswing load. And by the way, these numbers are all available or certainly the wrist angle will be put back into the app and so that you can look at these numbers yourself. And that's what I'm trying to show you at the moment. So let's now look at downswing loading. Again, two things to watch. This number down here, um, you'll see it getting smaller. And this wrist angle here, up the top, you'll see it getting smaller also. I think when I recorded this one, I did it much slower. So it's just gonna go click, click, click. You should be able to see it. Okay, see how that wrist angle is compressing, getting smaller. This number down here is getting smaller, down to 79. And now it starts to grow again as the release begins. So the release point can easily be defined, which is kind of interesting because it's gonna give us a lot of ways to compute like the time of release, how many milliseconds before impact, a lot of other trackers that we're gonna come out with uh, with wrist angle later on, um, because if it reaches its minimum and then starts to get a, to, to increase, that means that's the point of wrist release. So there is downswing loading. All right, so I did mention that downswing loading has several benefits physiologically and biomechanically. And what, what that refers to is the stretch shortened cycle of muscle. And the benefits that come from the stretch shortened cycle of muscle are free stretch, elastic energy storage, and the stretch reflex. And I'll talk about each one of those um, now, basically. So the stretch shortened cycle of definition first, it's a rapid eccentric muscle contraction followed by a rapid concentric muscle contraction with a minimal pause in between. Eccentric muscle contraction means that the muscle or the joint, sorry, the joint is extending and the muscle is extending too. Um, so it's trying to stop extending, it's trying to force against extending, but it's being extended. And a concept, concentric muscle contraction is the typical one that you expect. That's where you do like a bicep curl or, or uh, something similar. So the, the stretch shorten cycle really helps increase the force of muscle contraction during any athletic skill across all different types of sports. And I did mention the three reason, reasons that uh, it does, free stretch, stored, stored elastic energy, and stretch reflex. So let's go and have a look at what that means in each case. What is muscle free stretch and what does it do? Well, if you stretch the muscle, that tension in the muscle actually increases. And this is called the force velocity curve. And you can see this point here is isometric contraction. This back here is eccentric where it's lengthening. And then down here, you've got where it's speeding up and it's concentrically shortening, concentric contraction. So if we lift this whole curve up because we free stretched it, the vertical axis is force, we get a lot more force in the muscle all through the velocity profile, whether you're moving slowly or very quickly, you can generate more force. So that's, an, that's a reason that downswing loading um, helps us in the downswing because by loading the wrist, by stretching the wrist, you put more tension on the wrist muscles, the forearm muscles, and consequently uh, the muscles can contract more rapidly and faster. The second one is the elastic energy. I mentioned that muscles, tendons, and the fascia that holds the muscles all can act like elastic bands and store energy when stretched. Um, there's actually a muscle model here that can show you there's a, a parallel elastic component in the muscle, excuse me, in the muscle. And there's a series one, which is in the tendon. 
and then there's a contractile active component. So these little zigzags, this one here and this one here, they help store uh, the elastic energy. One thing we need to remember though, is the release needs to be quick. So the stretch and the release needs to be quick because if you hold it in that isometric contraction, um, the forces dissipate, disappear basically. Finally, the stretch reflex, that's uh, sensors in the muscle and the tendon. Um, if they're rapidly stretched, they cause the muscle to fire and pull in on itself, basically protect, protecting itself. So that stretch reflex, that can help also increase the force in the muscle and the rapid downswing loading of the wrist can elicit this stretch reflex. So there's a little bit of theory as to why um, the different profiles are good or not so good. Casting, um, as I said, is probably not the best, whereas fixed wrist angle set, downswing loading and late downswing loading um, tend to generate much more power. And you'll see that uh, in the pro golfer profiles when you capture them on sports box and uh, you'll be able to tell the difference depending on uh, what sort of profile you see in the wrist release. Um, so now um, we'll pass it on to Chris and he's gonna put some of the theory that I gave you into practice. And uh, along with other trackers and other indicators that we have in the Sportsbox app. And he's gonna talk about grip matchups and their influence on body motion. So take it over. I will give you back the screen and, and off you go. Thanks so much, Phil. Everybody see me? Um, we had a really great conversation a few days ago. Um, everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Um, really great conversation with Phil about this lead wrist angle. And uh, my plan was to go away over the weekend and do a presentation on um, body motions and why someone would cast it, but I couldn't find any of my players that cast it. So I didn't have great video for that. Um, so I did what I thought was very interesting to me is um, what I've done actually is compared my current player, Brendan Steele, who I've worked with for about 10 years, um, in extremely strong grip um, with one of my former players, Siwoo Kim, who I worked with at the back end of uh, last year, um, who has a very, very weak grip. So um, I found it very, very interesting and uh, looking forward to sharing some of this content with you guys. Um, See. Okay. So first, I thought what I'd do is actually show you guys sort of a kind of a side by side of what we're looking at here, which is which is quite shocking. Here's Seaward. Um, this is him. I think at the CJ Cup or Las Vegas. Um, as you can see, pretty weak grip. He's got one of the weakest grips on tour. Now, um, the weak grip obviously now is, you know, I think a little bit of a fad. A lot of people are running into sort of more flex left wrists. Um, DJ John Rahm's got very weak grip. Um, DJ's got a flex left wrist. Um, Spieth has got a weak grip. Gary Woodland's got a weak grip. Colin Morikawa's got a weak grip. So um, it's a bit of a thing. Obviously, you need compatible matchups with that. But I thought it was really interesting to um, kind of show you, you know, kind of what they do. I know that's not very, very clear, but you can kind of get a good idea as to how weak that left hand is. Here's Brendan, um, horrible looking grip. <laughs> it uh, obviously works for him. Very, very, very strong. Um, so it's kind of interesting sort of seeing how these guys set up next to each other. Um, and obviously these matchups that are going to have to happen. Now, I think, I think before, you know, I was a little bit, um, not naive, but, but sort of not truly understanding um, what was going on. And, and through this research with sports box, I think it's been incredible for me to understand sort of how to measure these body motions. Now, um, obviously, I think we all understand the compatible matchups of, of what has to happen with their lead wrist. Obviously, Siwoo on the left here with a very weak left hand, uh, Brendan with a very strong le uh, left hand. And you can kind of see, obviously, right away they go into that compatible matchup of the lead wrist. So, so see what gets it underneath, flexes the left wrist to get the face square immediately. 
um, Brendan will go away a little bit more extension and more out. We're always trying to keep him sort of out and open, but um, you can kind of see the club faces are actually, you know, pretty similar as they move up here into, into P2. I'm not a PE teacher, but um, it's probably just easiest for us to understand. Um, then as they move up, um, see where that keeps that left wrist a little bit more flexed. I would say personally that face is a little bit open. Um, Brendan's always had sort of this sort of open and laid off, um, just a really nice matchup for him. But obviously huge difference with arm planes and um, obviously lead wrist matchups in order to, to manage their faces. Um, on the downswing here, obviously C was coming from a much higher arm plane. Um, but what was very interesting putting these guys next to each other, which I've never done before, obviously, is the huge differences down here into sort of P6 here in the club face. Um, huge difference, obviously, with C. We're getting a lot more open, Brendan a lot more closed. Um, and then obviously how they manage those, those matchups and those club faces as they move down into impact. Now, beautiful. Both of them are beautifully on plane, um, fabulous ball strikers. He hits it very, very straight, likes to hit a little fade. I would say Brendan, for the most part, he likes to hit a draw, but it's, again, very straight and can move it, move it both ways, probably better than anybody I've ever worked with. Um, this is a lot of what I'm looking for for a lot of my swings. Working with Brendan has helped me tremendously. Um, I would say I was very much a textbook teacher about 13, 14 years ago. Um, felt like everybody needed to swing it like Tiger. Um, and then working with him, understanding what works for him, and then trying to match what he does so well with someone like Siwu, with someone like Matt Kuchar, with a Jim Furyk, with a Dustin Johnson. Trying to find those commonalities between what all these, you know, I would say weird grip or matchups do has really helped me tremendously as a coach. Um, just sort of understanding as to as to how people match up different grips, different arm movements. So this in entry into the ball is really a lot of what I'm looking for with all of my players and, and how can a player manage the face and the path as they come into entry and then through the ball. Um, see we're here a little bit more of a release, which I think is very interesting. And we'll see a lot more on, uh, on Sportsbox here. Brendan, a little bit higher handle. Uh, more of a full release there from from Siwu. Brendan lets it go, but he lets it go late. So he's he's interesting because he he keeps the face very square right until about two or three feet behind, after the ball, and then releases it pretty hard on the through and can actually get some where the face is really really turned down on the way through. But obviously, great golf swings. It's interesting to see them down the line. Now, um, what I'll go into is actually their sports boxes here. Um, this is Siwu. Uh, what I what I want to impress upon you, and you'll see this graph that I've put together in the on the uh, um, in a minute here in one of my slides is he's very interesting because he doesn't have much hand speed. I don't think I truly appreciate the difference between the hand speed of both players. Um, but I would say there's a little bit more chest turn and rotation. And then he has to slow down his body rotation as he gets the club face back to square. Um, and that's why he can't actually turn and hit it as hard as he potentially would like. It's very, very straight, but 7-9 here is probably only going about 170 yards. Brendan is hitting his 7-9 pretty much closer to 185, 190. So he hits a long way, obviously turning the, turning the club face down. Minimal chest turn, um, obviously started here about 8.7. So that number of chest turn here down in the bottom left, he's probably closer to 90 degrees. Um, we are, for the most part, always trying to get his lower body a little bit more stable. He does get a little bit of a butt twist and then the left shoulder gets high, which is, which is really bad for his strong grip. So I'm trying to get him usually a little bit more stable with a lower body, a little shorter and wider if I can, so that he can get down on top of it. Um, and then as he moves down, he has a little bit of slide. Here he comes, holds the angle very well. 
and then delosh the face. So a lot of what I've done, you see this slide in a minute, is just sort of understanding the difference between both players as basically they're from P6 to P7. And we can come back to these videos, but I just wanted to play these through for you. Um, so what I want to do is show you guys a graph here that I put together, which I think is very interesting. So on the top left here, we have Siwoo Kim at P6 and all of his sports box numbers underneath. Uh, Brendan at P6 as well. We've got Siwoo Impact, um, Brendan Impact, and then their personal changes from P6 to P7 as to um, what they have changed as they're moving from sort of entry P6 into Impact at P7. So um, some, some things that really sort of jumped out to me here um at p6 there steel is in the purple there you can see is adding more um chest and pelvis turn so pelvis turn at 10.4 versus versus c or at 3.9 obviously he's doing this to uh, manage the downswing um trying to rotate his body a little bit more just to keep the face a little bit more open um c on the other hand starting to slow down at this point um body rotation has to slow down he's getting a little bit more cast of the club to square it up he was different, a little bit more of a um, sort of a textbook, not an arm swinger, but very different to um, sort of a Hovland who would flex lead wrist dramatically and then rotate his body tremendously. Um, he was a little bit more of sort of a textbook, but getting the face a little bit open and then releasing it, releasing it late. Um, very straight hitter, like I said, but like to that little cut. Um, so pretty a um, little bit bigger differences there between their pelvis turns and their chest turns there at P6. Um, and then the major difference that really came out to me is in this red block block right here. Um, the difference between the hand speed and the lead wrist angle was pretty tremendous. So um, Brendan's, Brendan's hand speed there at 21.4 miles an hour, um, Siwoo's much shorter at 13.2. Now, it's my opinion, obviously, that Siwoo has to start slowing down his body rotation in order to manage the club face and get the club face back to square. What we all saw there halfway down with the face more open is that if he'd rotate as hard as Brendan, if his, if his hand speed was as fast as Brendan, he would just leave the face open and, and shank it or hit it high and right every time. So, so everything's starting to slow down here for Siwoo there at P6, mid hand speed at 13.2, Brendan's at 21.4. And then this lead wrist tracker was very interesting. So obviously the higher number, Siwoo here at 125.7, um, he's obviously let go of more wrist. So I think um, Phil will be able to talk uh, more intelligently to the mean of this, but 14 degrees of lead wrist angle seems like a tremendous difference to me um, as they're moving into, um, into entry. Um, obviously Brendan's got more of that extended lead wrist. He's able to do that, that flexion, um, on the lead wrist is a little bit more difficult to hold that angle. So um, you can start to see the patterns moving already as they're moving into impact with more rotation, more wrist angle, and more hand speed for steel with a, with a stronger grip. Um, as they move into impact here, that, ye that yellow box, um, what's interesting here is um, obviously steel has more chest and pelvis rotation um, but he's also added more as he's moved into impact. So the change for Siwoo is at 12.1 compared to before versus Steele's added another 15, um, 15 degrees of rotation with his pelvis turn. Um, interestingly, the chest turn is quite similar in terms of the amount that they've changed it right around 24 degrees. Um, so obviously as they're moving into impact, Steele's rotating and continues to rotate trying to keep that lever as, as extended as possible, trying to keep the face open and adding shaftling as he comes into impact. Um, and Siwoo is just actually starting to slow down tremendously. So the body rotation slowed down, even though he's moving the same amount of rotation from P6 to P7, it's obviously starting to slow down um, and he's got less in order to get the club face back to square. Um, uh, the other thing with steel here is um, he's actually adding a little bit of pelvis sway. Um, I'm always trying to get him to keep his chest a little bit more on top of the ball. Um, he's got a little bit more pelvis sway here. Um, you can see here in the um, in the blue box here, he's um, he's actually lost a little bit of X factor. So while 
well, uh, um, Siwa here has still got, he's going to change his X factor 7.8 degrees. Um, Steele's lost his 8.9. Now, that's for me is a little bit more pelvis way, um, a little bit more starting to stand up um, and then trying to get ahead of the ball to make sure the, the face obviously doesn't turn down, um, which I think is, is quite interesting. Uh, in the green box here, Siwu um, has started to slow the hand speed down. So he's moved um, from 13.2 um, miles an hour to 9.9. .9. So he's starting to slow it down. Um, incredibly, that's nine miles an hour slower than steel. So I, I think for me, what's, what was interesting here is the amount of hand speed that had to be required in order to manage a more closed face. I think for me, I. I would have assumed that the matchup was the was the more extended left wrist um, with the shut face, and and then more body rotation. We're seeing the body rotation, but not exponentially more into impact. What we are seeing is an increase in uh, in hand speed, or not necessarily an increase, but far 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 greater hand speed um, with the stronger grip and the more closed face. Um, see, we're here, obviously, in the green box here. It's starting to slow the hand speed down. He's get he's got less less sorry less shaft lean um, at impact at seventy eight point six um, compared to, to Steele's seventy. So obviously he's delofting the face versus opening the face that will account for the seventeen yards of difference between the seven irons. Um, and that for me is just obviously slowing the body down, moving the hands down, and getting the club face back to square. So um, pretty interesting. So. What we'll do is go back into um, back into these numbers here, and you can kind of see what we were talking about at the beginning. So, steel as he's moving down into impact, far more shaft angle. Left wrist stays extended, a little bit of hip slide or pelvis sway, as we say in uh, on um, sports box there, and he keeps the angle. The rotations there, not tremendous amount of rotation like you would see maybe from a Zach Johnson, who's also got a very strong grip or a Paul Azinger. Um, and then he keeps that shaft angle as he moves from P6 into P7 and has a little bit more shaft lean as a result. Um, from there, he can actually just let it go and move all the way through. See we here we go. So less pelvis way, stays on top of it more with his chest, actually starts to move into a little bit of side bend, slows down with the hands, slows down with the body rotation. And then from there, from P60 kicks in, it's still a little bit of body rotation. So remember that's the same amount that he increased it as steel from P6 to P7 but he has to let that club go. There's less shaft lean as he moves into impact, obviously because of that left-hand grip. And then he ha um, has to let the club go past him much faster as a result. Big full release compared to steel and then moving up into, into um, his full swing. So I um, hope you guys enjoyed um, kind of seeing two very, very different um, players. And um, for me, it was interesting to see the difference is obviously um, in what they were doing with their body, how to measure those. Um, and uh, for me, moving forward, um, it's going to be much easier for me to use sports box and uh, help a player with a weak, weak grip or help a player with a strong grip and, and kind of see the matchups that they're going to be required. Does anybody have any questions for me? Yeah, I think there are some questions. If you guys um, put them in the chat, we can go through them. Thanks, Chris. Sure. Let's see. Um, let me start with this. Uh, Brian Pate, would trail wrist motion be more similar amongst golfers than lead wrist on the graphs? Players are all over the map on lead hand grip, but a little less with trail. I don't know, Phil or Chris, either of you. Yeah, the sounds lead, like a fail question. Yeah, the lead, the lead wrist. Um, I'm going back to the grip uh, measurements, which at this point in time we don't 
have, and that's one thing I want to point out, at the, the moment we don't have the grip measurements, but the cool thing is because we've got the video side by side with the 3D avatar, you can still look to see whether it's a strong or a weak grip. Um, yeah, the lead grip um, does vary more. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but the lead grip uh, strong versus weak varies much more than the trail hand grip does. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Hill. Um, Eric Crawford, just curious, does this analysis, analysis apply to a cross-handed grip? I don't think so, right? Wow. We don't do cross-handed. I don't think we have that ability to cross-hand it in the app. Um, here's another <coughs> one from Craig Foster. Can you determine degrees of rotation at the elbow joint, proximal or distal, by measuring change in wrist angle? Uh, repeat that question, if you would, and I'll, I'll try and handle it. Can you determine degrees of rotation at the elbow joint, proximal and or distal, by measuring change in wrist angle? Well, the wrist angle that we're measuring is the simple wrist angle. I like to call it the simple wrist angle because it's really just a line down the forearm and a line down the shaft. So it's not like the three degree of freedom wrist angle that you were able to measure with AMM where you could measure flexion extension, ulnar radial deviation, and supination pronation. We're kind of measuring the, the combination of all those three angles and what they do to the angle between uh, the shaft and the club. Is it cocking or uncocking? It's kind of all comprised into just one motion, which is, again, like I say, the angle between the forearm and the shaft. And also remember that the supination pronation is created by the radius and the ulna bones rolling on top of one another. So you're going to have a lot of wrist angle in terms of supination pronation distal to the elbow, as you're saying but you're gonna have virtually no rotation down here at the base of the elbows. The amount of rotation increases because the bones are rolling on top of one another. So um, trying to remember what the original part of the question was. No, I think it would be difficult to, to determine that. Um, like I said, we can't get at the moment the three degrees of freedom of the wrist. Maybe in the future we'll be able to, but uh, not at this point. Okay, um, here's one for Chris. How would you redu reduce steel side bend and not create left shots? Uh, I mean, he very rarely hits it left anyway. Um, if anything, he's trying to draw the ball more, which is really interesting. Um, the other thing, which I'm not even sure he knows, is his clubs are a little bit flat for him. So as the club goes in, it actually kicks the face a little bit open. And I think I think that little stand up um, and side bend is in response to what he knows is going to feel through the ground. So um, it's a very, very interesting um, thing with his clubs being slightly flat because um, obviously it's kicking in and the ends up slightly for him. Um, uh, another coach uh, back in the day tried to try to neutralize his bends and then he ended up hitting snap hooks for everything. Um, so um, he bent them back to normal, and I don't think he realizes that flat for him, but uh, uh, it's very interesting. So, no, I wouldn't try and change his side bend um, only because um, only because I don't I don't think that would benefit his his hook actually at all. Mm -hmm. um, here's one Not from sure Tim, Tim Krause. Do you feel that the variations are caused by arm measurements and leg versus torso measurements? I don't know if that is that for Phil. Well, I think Chris, you can try that one first, and I'll try and follow up. If you need to, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that's interesting. It was, uh, you know, obviously looking at the side by side swings, like Siwoo's got longer arms for his torso and and has an eye, higher higher arm plane. I think I think he needs to do that um, in order to generate speed. I think if you flattened him out, it, I mean, it's just taken away any aspect of speed that he would, he would ever have with the grip being so weak. And like I alluded to in the presentation, 
you can see there he's got a very weak grip it's it's a flex left wrist but not a ton of flex left wrist and the face is still open coming down so he's got to somehow figure out how to square it up um so I'm not, I think I've gone on a, ten, on a tangent there, but I'm not sure that answers the question. No, I think that was good, yeah. Okay, um, from Mike Kim, if Siwoo wants to hit it farther, what does he need to do? Um, that's a great question. I'm obviously not coaching him now. Um, I would have my theories. Interestingly, when I started with him, it looked to me like he was trying to hit it very hard. He had massive rotation early in the backswing and his arms would go very far. Um, he would swing longer um, and, then, and then the club would come back out in front of him and, and occasionally get a hook. So what I did was actually quieten down his first move um, so that his lower body wouldn't race away and rotate too early. Um, and I got him a little shorter and wider at the top. Um, just my preferences. He hit it very, very straight and hit it very well but I, I think he wanted, wanted the speed. Um, so, you know, if it was, if it was up to me, obviously we all know more body rotation, greater hand depth or length, um, more pressure in the ground. Um, my preference personally would have been to keep the sequencing as it was with less lower body early in the backswing, shorter at the top. And then for me, I would get him to, to press harder into the ground in transition so that he was using his lower body a little bit more rather than just staying slow like we saw on the sports box and throwing his hands at it. Okay, um, from Tatsuro, what is the angle difference between Kim and Brendan's lead wrist angle P1 to P7? That's a good, that's good. I didn't, I um, didn't run the, um, uh, the recording on that, I was more focused on six to seven, um, but I'm happy to send him the video that I did. <laughs> well, so we can, can see it. <laughs> yeah. um, from Frank Wren, um, if a player continues to flip it or go into left wrist extension with a weak grip, does this mean his left hand grip may be too weak? Player continuously slides laterally with the lower body and adds too much right side bend, dumps the upper body. So we, um, Phil and I had a great conversation on Saturday about this. We were, we were hoping to get to a, um, a little bit more of a interesting um, conversation on casting, which is obviously what, uh, what this uh, coach is asking about. Um, I feel very strongly that it's very, very difficult for, to get players to change their wrist condition. I, I, I personally, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but for me, I think it's much easier to change a grip than it is to change a wrist condition. Now, if a player is a terrific player, if they're a tall player, a really good junior, and they're able to manage their grip and wrist condition, I hate changing grips. I don't want to change grips. You can see, see with those two players, I've potentially worked with the weakest and strongest grip on tour there at the same time. Um, so, so I don't want to change grips at all. If I feel like it's changing what they're doing and in, in, in this instance, they're sliding, side bending, throwing it left wrist and extension, I would definitely strengthen the grip. I wouldn't, there's no way a player like that is going to be able to manage flexion on the backswing and downswing and then start rotating. For me, I would get the grip stronger, let the wrist condition stay the same. And then from there with the ball hooking, then they'll be able to actually manage a little bit more rotation with the body and there's, and what we saw um, in the presentation there, more, more um, hand speed as a result. Okay, um, from Logan Murphy, out of tour player data, what style of wrist loading out of the three is the most common? Well, I guess that's up to me. Uh, I think the jury's out on that one still, but I think it's just simple downswing loading. It seems to be the more, more common one. I see quite a bit of late downswing loading, but occasionally fixed angle, but mostly I think downswing loading. And then all of them have their positives. I mean, again, from the, from the power point of view and the, and the stretch shortening cycle, um, the late downswing loading is probably the most effective as far as that's concerned, um, but not too much difference between them really. 
don't see any casting. Well, one or two you see casting, but not too often. Any more questions for Chris or Phil? Oh, just another point on that. The, the discussion we were having on the weekend was kind of whether the, the women, because they had that, I showed you they were slightly more released at uh, um, 30 degrees than the men. And the discussion on that was, well, is it a, is it a technique issue or is it a um, strength issue? So what, what I did immediately there is I went back and I looked at, and I can probably share my screen to give you a quick example of what I'm talking about. But how much time we, we're doing okay. We've got a few more minutes on time, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have uh, time. Yeah, so let me just show you this. So I went and grabbed uh, 30 males and 30 females, all four pros. And I just, are you seeing that, at, seeing my screen at the moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, and you're seeing the graphs? Yep. Uh, so what I've got here, on the left is the women and on the right is the men. And so you can see there's a downswing loading, there's a fixed wrist with a slight little late release. There's a huge late release, another huge late release, um, downswing loading. So you see all the vanilla, all the flavors, if you like, there's a fixed wrist. And the left, like I said, is the women and the right is the men. And I wanted to see if they were, were the women casting more, were the men downswing loading more? And really you saw all flavors in both the men and the women. So of course that led me to believe that there's definitely not a difference as far as uh, the, the technique and the proficiency of the technique. So it may come down to simply the lead of the arm strength and the shoulder strength differences between the men and the women as to why that's happening. Thanks, Phil. Um, <clears throat> all right, we have another one for Mike Kim. Who is an example of late downswing loading? Well, uh, probably one of my guys, huh? Scott Piercy. Uh, I don't know if I've got Scott right here at the moment, but let me just have a quick look. Uh, late downswing loading. Peter Uline was one. Uh, let's see now. JJ Spawn. Although he was quite a bit downswing loading, but did increase it. Um, I'm going. Scott Piercy, yep. Yep, I got Scott right here. Uh, so Scott actually, I don't know if anybody's seen his swing, but he actually casts it from the top early and then loads it by probably P6 there. You know what's really cool is you can see exactly what you just said here in the wrist profile. You see how he gets to a, a wrist set down there, a low angle, then at top of the backswing it increases and then decreases. Ernie Elf does the same thing. He kind of casts it a little bit and then reloads it just before release. So that's kind of an interesting uh, profile difference, if you like. Um, that, was, uh, that was the next question too, does Scott Piercy cast? <laughs> he starts the cast, but then he pulls it into a downstream load. So no, yeah. I would say no, he does no, not no. cast. Interesting. So you can see that the cool thing is from the sports box graphs, and the AMM graphs and the risk graphs, uh, we can learn a lot. Now, we don't have the graphs at the moment, but you could also see it directly in the avatar and their lead risk angle numbers. You just simply play it through from the top of backswing. Does it decrease or does it increase? Simple. Then um, we have another one from Tim Kraus. Uh, Phil, do you feel the greater angle at 30 degrees in the downswing for ladies is has to do with the way the forearm, forearm hangs from the elbow. No, uh, I do not because everybody, male and female, they come in all different shapes and sizes and I see all of the different uh, styles uh, for both men and women. So no, I don't think it's a morphological thing or anthropomorphic thing. I think it's uh, what a technique they've learned and uh, yeah. That's my belief. Okay, if there are no more questions, um, thank you, Chris, again, and thank you, Phil, as always. That was great. Um, and 
if you guys sent me your PGA numbers, I'll send those in um, along with the ones from last the last webinar. So apologize, apologies, I had not sent those in yet, but they will go in tonight. Um, and yeah, last chance for questions. We have another two minutes. No more. Last call. All right. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us again tonight, and thank Chris and Phil. Um, Thanks for having me. See you again soon. Bye, y'all. All right. Bye. Good night.